Okay, hello everybody. I think Helen has um, just started the recording of the session, so that's probably a good prompt for me to um, begin the introductions. I'm Jim Stuart Evans from Public Health England. Um, on behalf of the Breathing City and Future Urban Ventilation Network, and uh, this is the latest in our seminar series. So just firstly, um, some quick housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions about the presentation, um, please put those in the chat channel as we go through. And after John's finished today, I'll uh, pick out, I'll go through the questions and, and um, we'll go through those. Uh, so we'll do the Q&A at the end. Otherwise, please do keep yourselves on uh, mute and uh, respect one another's contributions. Uh, today's event is being recorded and uh, please do get involved on social media, tag us in your tweets at Breathing City. We're quite active on uh, social media so you can find out more about the network uh, there as well. So this slide just shows the Breathing City team. So we're overseen by the PI who's Professor Kath Noakes at Leeds and coordinated by Dr. Helen. Freeman, who's with us today as well. And I mentioned I'm Jim Stuart Evans. So I'm based at Public Health England rather than a university. And we're one of many other local and national government healthcare and wider organisations who are stakeholders in this Breathing City Network's uh, work. And today I'm delighted to introduce uh, an academic colleague at Public Health England, who is Professor John Thorns and John is Emeritus professor, professor in Applied Meteorology at the University of Birmingham and he's also Principal Climate Change Scientist at Public Health England. He has a long-standing interest in weather climate change and air pollution and their impact on society and his PhD related to predicting ice formation on roads and uh, that led to the setting up of two university spin-out companies at the University of Birmingham and Having first lectured in climatology at UCL, he then moved to the University of Birmingham to run their MSc course in Applied Meteorology and Climatology. And nowadays, John is researching the impact of extreme weather and climate change on ambulance performance and response times across the UK. And he's also researching interventions to reduce air pollution in enclosed railway stations and the new urban clean air zones. And today he's going to tell us more about his work on air quality in Birmingham New Street. And I'm particularly grateful uh, to John for presenting on this, as it was something that came up as a, as a question in a previous uh, presentation as well. So as usual, we'll use the last part of this hour session for a short Q&A afterwards. So again, please add any questions to the chat as we go, and, and we'll use the time at the end to go through them. And without any further ado uh, from me, John, thank you for today and over to you. Thanks, Jim. Let's see if I can share my screen. Please do. There we go. Can you see me now? Yeah, it's it's showing fine. Thanks, John. Right. Hello. I hope I hope you can all hear me. So yeah, I'm Professor John from the University of Birmingham, as Jim has said. And for the last few years, I've been working for Public Health England. And uh, obviously, one of the projects you'll see me standing here outside Birmingham New Street Station, talking to Channel Four dispatchers, which is one of the things in a rather di difficult way to get a research project going but we'd had difficulty in getting Birmingham New Street Network Rail who actually run the station to do anything about the air quality in the station and therefore I eventually got so frustrated I went on dispatches and which is available on on YouTube if you want to have a look uh, to actually uh, persuade the station to do something about their air quality and as a result of going on dispatches having tried all other routes and failed they actually agreed to do a monitoring project 
with the University of Birmingham to actually look at what the air quality at the New Street Station was like. And that's what I want to tell you about today in terms of what we discovered and how uh, that has changed Network Rail's attitude uh, to air quality. And we're now working with them rather than against them you know, to actually improve the air quality at New Street Station. And that's an ongoing project, obviously, as, as you'll see. I don't know much about Leeds Railway Station, but I was born in Batley, which is just up the road from, uh, from Leeds. And uh, so I do know what the station's like. And I have got one interesting uh, graph at the very end of the talk, which compares Leeds to other railway stations. So you can look forward to, uh, to seeing that at the end of the, uh, of, the, of the talk. So let's get on without further ado. This was the paper wrote back in, uh, published in 2016. And this was our first attempt. I was quite surprised how little research had been done into uh, railway station air quality, particularly enclosed railway stations. Obviously, I don't know how many of you have been to Birmingham New Street Station, but it's very enclosed. And obviously Leeds Station is also enclosed to a large extent. So there are some comparisons there, although I don't think anyone's done any direct observations in Leeds yet, but we'll talk about that uh, at the end. But uh, this paper therefore plugged a gap, and in fact we were awarded a prize by the Institution of Civil Engineers for the best transport paper back in 2018. So I was rather surprised to find that uh, there was a, a gr growing market out there for information about the air quality and enclosed railway stations. As you'll see, it's a fairly complicated thing in terms of whether this is indoor or outdoor pollution. And obviously, uh, we'll talk about that as well. So that was the paper. So it's not, it wasn't just me. Obviously, there's a team of us. Alice Hickman was actually a graduate student, and she uh, was my one of my PhD students who did a lot of the work on this uh, monitoring campaign. And obviously, other members of staff from the University of Birmingham were listed there too. And uh, obviously, it's a, a team event. But uh, so I, I'm wearing my university hat and I'm wearing my Public Health England hat all the way through this presentation. So just as an introduction, as I mentioned, air quality in enclosed railway stations have been largely ignored. And obviously there's a distinction here to be made between occupational and public health in terms of the people who work in the stations and the passengers who pass through the stations, which we'll see later on. But uh, Obviously, the main problem is diesel uh, trains. And back in 2012, the World Health Organization, their international agency for research on cancer, uh, on research, reclassified diesel exhaust as carcinogenic. And uh, obviously, that's something that has led on through the EU to new worker exposure limits for nitrogen oxide and nitrogen dioxide introduced to the UK by the Health and Safety Executive on the August 25th, 2018. So indeed, things are uh, uh, changing, but you'll see there's a huge difference between the uh, public health limits and the occupational health limits, and we'll talk about that later. Now, it's the Office of Rail and Road that's responsible for ensuring that these new wells are enforced in railway stations, together with the station operators and obviously the train operating companies. So it's usually quite a story to try and find out who's responsible in these sort of cases. So it's not Birmingham City Council, it is actually uh, the Office of Road and Rail who are responsible, together with Network Rail, as, as we'll see if we go through. So I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the various makeup of diesel engine exhaust. But it's really oxides of nitrogen that we've been focusing on and particulate matter to some extent. But we didn't find that particulate matter is, is a great problem at New Street Station. It's really the oxides of, of nitrogen that have given us the, the problem. Obviously, carbon dioxide is also monitored. And, uh, but the actual carcinogenic effects are the, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and the other bits and pieces of benzene, et cetera, as you see at the bottom there. So obviously, in a sense, the carbon dioxide and the oxides of nitrogen are sort of measures that showing how high the diesel exhaust is in the particular station at the time. 
it was really the oxides of nitrogen that we concentrated on because that's obviously that's been a big topic of interest on the outside of stations on the on the normal rows etc so current legislation is uh, monitored by the office of rail and road and uh, network rail and the train operators at new street station have a legal duty to manage the risk to employees and passengers from exposure to hazardous substances and workplace exposure limits are used as part of COSH, which stands for the Control of Substances Hazardous to Health Regulations. So we have this uh, difference between occupational health for the staff and public health limits and passengers obviously are public health, but occupational health standards are very much higher as we'll see in terms of uh, the levels of pollution that are allowed for occupational health uh, versus public health. And that's partly because the people working at the station are expected to be fitter and healthier than your general public. But that's obviously a contentious issue. But we'll see the huge differences in levels of uh, pollution that are allowable under these two headings as we go through. And this uh, is an, an official um, report diesel engine exhaust emissions in the railway sector. The last issue was by the Office of Rail and Road in June 2018, and our next issue is June 2021. So we're waiting to, to see that. But basically, they set the, uh, the way that this is monitored within uh, railway stations, and obviously in particular, enclosed railway stations. And we've been, been in touch with them, and they've taken our results very seriously which is nice to know. So this was uh, another paper that we uh, more recently to discuss today, the proposed interventions to reduce noxious air pollution at Birmingham New Street Station. So this was, uh, we were invited by the Institution of Civil Engineers uh, to give them a, a seminar on, on our research on the previous paper that I mentioned. And this was this new uh, research is uh, is based on the work that we've been doing in the last couple of years. So times are moving on and we're getting actually, we've persuaded Network Rail to take uh, pretty serious interventions to reduce the air pollution, which they now accept is, uh, is serious. When we first spoke to Network Rail, they were quite um, adamant that the air pollution in the station was coming in from the traffic outside rather than the other way around. We'll see that's uh, not, not the case, as you'll see. So just a quick summary of uh, the high levels of NOx in the enclosed railway station are due to diesel passenger trains, as we'll see. And there, when the station was re, revamped, as we, again, we'll look at soon, um, 98 ventilation fans were installed which were originally driven by carbon dioxide sensors, but the NOx levels were ignored because there was no monitoring of the NOx levels. So there was an intervention to install over a hundred new NOx sensors to drive the fans instead. And so we'll see how successful that's been. Obviously there are other future plans to introduce hybrid trains that can switch off diesel engines and possibly use electrified entry into the station because every platform in the station can take electric trains but only about half of the, uh, the trains are electric, again, as we'll see. So in terms of reviewing the success of interventions, obviously that's been, to some extent, that, that all happened just before COVID. So we've had problems in terms of measuring exactly how effective these new uh, sensors have been, but obviously that's something that uh, we're ongoing. And so far, um, so good, as we'll see. Now, Birmingham New Street Station has obviously got quite a long history. And here are some images of the enclosed nature of the station going back to 1854. And uh, again, 1885. And obviously there are lots of enclosed railway stations, very nice looking, but obviously traps the pollution and uh, uniquely at Birmingham, as we'll see. This was uh, the redevelopment in 1965. And ever since then, Birmingham New Street Station was voted as the worst station in Britain, not just <laughs> as we've shown for air pollution, 
but also for the uh, concrete mon monstrosity uh, that was redeveloped back in 1965. And yeah, it's, so it's been revamped again in 2015 at a cost of 600 million. This is what it used to look like. Uh, in the 60s and 70s up to 2014. It was very crowded, rather very concrete uh, looking thing. And the, as you can see, the platforms are enclosed, completely enclosed. Like, so it's much more like a tunnel than a, than a platform. And that was what was trapping the pollution. And so uh, the new street, new street station, as it were, opened in 2015 now with what's called Grand Central, which is a big shopping center on top of the station. Uh, it's been smartened up, as you can see, with this reflective material all the way around. And it thinks it's great. You can see there's a great big uh, television screen here. So this is, this is, you can see the entrance to the platforms here, which are going into the tunnel. And the Grand Central is built on top of the uh, of the platforms. But obviously, some of the pollution is actually escaping from the platforms into the shopping arena, as we'll see. So, New Street Station summary. It's the busiest station outside London, normally up to 200,000 passenger movements a day. And there's that 600 million upgrade completed in 2015, including the 98 ventilation fans. And as we'll see, those ventilation fans were actually really what you might find in a car park. They weren't really ventilation. The, the idea of the ventilation of blowing the pollution out of the station uh, was something that was not really suitable for a, a station, as we'll find out. There are 12 platforms beneath the concourse in a tunnel-like environment which traps the diesel air pollution, and also some of the pollution from the electric trains as well, but that's much more particulars rather than uh, uh, NOx. Now, something like 45% of the trains that serve New Street are diesel. And there are something like 600 diesel train movements per day. Well, that was before COVID. Obviously, that's been uh, offset to some extent. During COVID, the numbers have gone down. But they're coming back up to normal at the moment. So with University of Birmingham Network Rail worked in collaboration and that's the uh, HPRU is uh, one of the projects we were working on and developed an extensive monitoring campaign to better understand the air quality in and around the station. So we did a mo big monitoring campaign 2016 to 17. Now I'm sure you're probably familiar with the, uh, the daily air quality index, which is what we think about when, it, as far as passengers are concerned rather than occupational health, this is public health. And you can see for nitrogen dioxide that the low levels are normally below 200 micrograms per meter cubed as an only mean. And, uh, and, but the long term average for NO2 is 40 micrograms per meter cubed, which is not to be exceeded in more than 18 days. And uh, as, we'll, as we'll see, that turned out to be the first 18 days of the year were exceeding those levels. So but if you get an idea, 600 is considered to be high, over 600 is very high levels in the station. And we'll see that's exceeded on many occasions. So these, these are planned views of the station. This, this is the, so to the west and to the east. The first thing we did was put diffusion tubes into every platform in the station to find out where the worst levels were. Uh, which we'll have a look at. And, uh, and this, this is the, the lounge immediately above the, uh, the station. And we had diffusion tubes in the three lounges. And then we put diffusion tubes around the station so we could see what the levels were like in comparison to inside the station, what the levels are, are like outside the station. And obviously one of the things we'll talk about a little bit later is the new clean air zone uh, New Street Station is right in the middle of the of the clean air zone, which started on June the 1st, just a few weeks ago within Birmingham. So it's quite a source for, uh, for pollution, as we'll see. So these were the results from the diffusion tube. These are the 12 platforms. 
and you can see the uh, the concentrations here. We 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 did two samples uh, for two weeks, and then we changed the the uh, diffusion tubes over and, and did another sample for two weeks, uh, just to compare the the results and for consistency. We had samples uh, comparative comparative in the west of the station, in the centre, and right in the middle of the tunnel, and in the east. And you can see the levels in the centre. And these are averages. And we should be comparing this with the long-term average that we're looking for, 40 micrograms per metre cube. You can see the levels are more than 10 times higher than that 40 uh, in the centre on many, on several of the platforms, getting up into the 500s uh, platforms. Uh, down here. So if we look at um, platform two is one of the highest as well. And that so the, the highest levels are actually platforms one and two and 11 and 12, which are at the edge of the uh, of the station. So the pollution so is trapped uh, in the edge as, as it mix, it's mixed by the trains going through, but it tends to be highest on the edges as well as, as we'll see. So that was uh, Platform two was quite high with over 500. And the lounges above, you see the yellow, what's called the yellow lounge, levels over 300. And uh, similarly in the blue lounge, in the red lounge, slightly, uh, slightly, slightly lower, but still exceedingly uh, high compared to the 40 micrograms per meter cube that we should be looking for. Now, when we look, um, at the, the higher levels, it's really platforms eight down to 12. It was, in the end, we decided on platforms 11 and 12 to do the actual uh, monitoring, more detailed case. Now, uh, surrounding the station, I was, I was obviously you're probably aware that as far as traffic is concerned in the city of Birmingham and everywhere else around the country, people look at the areas that exceed 40, and you can see that the the areas around the station are exceeding 40, but are ex extremely low compared to in the station. And uh, the areas A, which is next to the, uh, uh, the station, is the highest. And then the areas furthest away from the station uh, are the lowest, getting down to at least into the 40s. But obviously, uh, it's certainly not the case that the pollution is coming in from outside. It's very much the case that the pollution is going out from the station to increase its levels close to the station. And, uh, the lowest level is the one furthest away. Now then, once we decided where we wanted to put our more permanent uh, kits, we actually were working with Birmingham City Council. And they provided us with the actual uh, kit to measure the uh, NOx, PM, CO2, black carbon as well. When we first installed the, uh, the sensors that the council used on their roads, we found that they weren't capable of, uh, the levels were so high, we had to send them back to be recalibrated, uh, as you might imagine, uh, because they weren't used to anything like what we were actually observing within the station. So this is where we, we set up a setup like this, at, um, towards the east end, in the center of the station, and towards the, uh, the west end. And uh, between platforms 10 and 11 towards the south end. So the shaded area is the tunnel area. The, the station opens out, as we saw from those early pictures, uh, to the east and to the west. And the ventilation fans are, are inside the, the covered areas, and which are and the ventilation fans blow from one direction, depending on the wind direction. If the wind is from the west, which it most likely is, the fans will blow the pollution this way. If the wind is from the east, then the, the fans will blow the pollution that way. But we'll talk about that again later in terms of the ventilation. So what did we find when we were doing more detailed monitoring? Well, these are daily maximum hourly observations um, for nitrogen dioxide. And you'll see that the daily air quality index level 10 of 600 micrograms per meter cubed was exceeded on virtually every day. 
the only two days of the year in, in our study, it went from the middle of November to the middle of January in 2016 to 17. The only two days when the levels were below pretty much the uh, 600 micrograms per meter cube were Christmas Day and Boxing Day when there were no trains. So the levels are down here. And that's nice to know that our system was working, uh, but also it just shows you that the levels inside the station are very high indeed and obviously stretching up into the thousands of micrograms per meter cube because of all those diesel trains. And if we compare the, that observation with the road observations, the Tyburn Road and Moore Street Queensway, you can see how the, uh, the road observations are dwarfed by the levels of NOx, uh, well, NO2 inside the station. So that's for public health in a sense. And what we might, it would be nice to have a passenger index as opposed to a daily air quality index. We might develop a passenger air quality index. Obviously, these levels are uh, averages over, over an hour. So the, obviously, passengers aren't normally in the station for an hour. Although that, that does sometimes happen when people are switching trains, etc., and trains are delayed. You can very easily be in the station for an hour on many occasions. I certainly have been when I've been commuting in and out of New Street Station. Now, the new occupational health levels, uh, which came in in August 2018 for nitrogen dioxide, as I mentioned earlier, the eight hour average was 955 micrograms per meter cubed, which is obviously way beyond the 40 micrograms or the 200 micrograms per meter cubed that for the daily air quality index. And the 15 minutes still, that's the short term limit, is 1,910 micrograms per meter cube for nitrogen dioxide. So these levels are enormous compared to uh, the daily air quality index. For nitrogen monoxide, or nitric oxide as we often call it, the level is 2,500 micrograms per meter cube. So these levels are very much higher, but surprise, surprise, we managed to surpass them. So here is the workplace exposure limits. This is the maximum NO2 hourly concentrations. And you can see that the short term 15 minute style, which is much more applicable to passengers, obviously, because you certainly will be in the station for 15 minutes or so. You can see that on 40% of the days, that level of 1910 was being exceeded. The eight hour average wasn't quite so bad. The eight hour average of 955 the levels were much lower. Well, not much lower, they're still uh, quite high uh, compared to the daily uh, quality index, but they didn't actually exceed that level uh, on more than one or two occasions. As the 15 minutes still is concerned, obviously that's very dangerous for people working in the station as well as for passengers. And this is the nitric oxide equivalent you can see two and a half thousand was exceeded virtually every day, apart from Christmas and New Year and a few other days. So that was uh, extremely high. And obviously, one of the things that we need to do further research on is to look at the actual air chemistry that's going on in the station. Because obviously in this tunnel environment, you've got no solar radiation coming into the equation. Uh, you've got your, your ozone, filtering in from outside the station, uh, being blown in by the wind, etc. So the actual chemistry that's going on in, in the ozone levels that are in the station uh, is still something that we need to do further research on and how that converts with the, uh, the nitric oxide into the nitrogen dioxide and the speed of chemical exchange, etc. So a lot more research is needed on the actual chemistry. These are just the, the bare observations. There was a study done by the uh, railway, the RSSB, uh, which is a sort of research arm, a government research arm, funded research arm that does research for Network Rail, Railway Safety and Standards Board. They did a survey at King's Cross Station and Edinburgh. And there's a comparison here with Birmingham New Street Station. You can see as far as NO2 is concerned, uh, this is for uh, King's Cross, 
levels of uh, NO2 compared to the 40 micrograms per meter cubed. There's some exposure there. Similarly at uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh Waverley, and you can see how New Street Station was way beyond what was at Edinburgh or London. And uh, they didn't do, they haven't done the workplace exposure limit one on this, but there's some small exposures at uh, King's Cross and Edinburgh. Similarly for PM 2.5, the levels again at Birmingham New Street were beyond what was at, at uh, Edinburgh or King's Cross. Now, what's the responsible for all this? Well, obviously these are typical diesel trains that run in and out. These are the 158s, the Turbo Star. And so we were able to do some comparison between the actual, these trains coming into the station and the actual peaks in the you know, two concentrations. And you can see on, on occasions when the uh, Turbo Star comes into the station, but also the, the most polluting train that we discovered was the Voyagers. And the, a lot of these are cross-country trains. These are the 220s here. And it shows you the ratio here of the pollution when the uh, ratio of the concentration when the platforms are occupied compared to average concentrations. And you can see how when the Voyagers come into the station, there's massive peaks on occasions. So the Voyagers are... Uh, now, cross-country trains who run these, a lot of these voyages, and they used to be Virgin trains as well. Obviously, they're all diesel. They don't have any electric trains. So obviously, there's a push uh, to persuade them to actually switch to electric trains or hybrid trains. And obviously, uh, we'll talk at the end briefly about the what's going on in that area. But they're the ones that are, the, from our point of view, of Birmingham, the, the biggest polluters. Now, talking of ventilation, the new 98 fans that were installed in the station were originally controlled by carbon dioxide sensors. These carbon dioxide sensors are, as I say, the sort of thing that you would use in a car park probably to decide. But you can see from this graph, if you look at the, mon the when the vans, the ventilation fans <laughs> are triggered when the carbon dioxide goes above a thousand parts per million in this case. You can see if you look at a thousand parts per million here, that's not picking up all this, these indications here when the nitrogen dioxide concentrations are up into the thousands there to be missed by carbon dioxide. So we found a low correlation really between the carbon dioxide measures and the levels of NOx. So, and similarly with the uh, black carbon concentrations as well, which relates to the uh, PM levels. There's high PM levels here below the thousand uh, PPM mark to switch on the fans. So the fans had four levels. Uh, emergency, supposedly when it goes greater than uh, two to three and a half thousand, then you see very hardly ever got up to that level of switching the fans onto their highest mode. So the fans really weren't working very effectively. So what was done following our uh, research, Network Rail were very responsive in terms of introducing new NOx sensors to drive the, the ventilation system rather than the carbon dioxide. Although they still measure carbon dioxide as well. Um, the new NOx sensors were installed. And, uh, the, this was enhanced in 2019 following our survey. So that was very good that Network Rail took the initiative, spent nearly uh, three quarters of a million pounds to put these new sensors in and link into the building management system, that, which is this uh, system here. Now you'll see that the ventilation fans are bi-directional. So they can blow east or west. And you can see that uh, the gas sensors are at sort of head height to come to drive the individual fans. So there's a, a set of sensors come next to every fan effectively across the, uh, the platform here. So that's, uh, that was a very uh, good response by Network Rail to our research. So the question is how effective has this new system been? compared to the old. 
these are the new sensors. Now the sensors are produced by a company called Kimesa, which are, is a Swiss company. So we hadn't heard of them before, but uh, these, this was the, the company that provided the original carbon dioxide sensors. Don't know if you've heard of them. So this is some data from the new system in terms of these are maximum values recorded on the between the 3rd and the 13th of August 2020 using the new system. And you can see there's still some very high individual levels. Obviously, as far as the uh, occupational health standards are concerned, they are meant to be 15 minutes averages. These aren't, these aren't averages, these are actual observations. And you can see probably when a Voyager comes into the station, levels still rocketing up there to 6,000 micrograms per meter cubed. Uh, but most of the time, the values are. And one of the problems with COVID has been that we haven't been allowed into the station to actually uh, get hold of it. lots of data. This is the only sample data that we've seen so far. So that's something that still needs to be done. But one of the things we found with the original carbon dioxide sensors for the ventilation system to decide whether to blow east-west or west to east, west to east was this was the original wind sensor that was installed in the station to determine the, uh, obviously which way the fan should blow. And we discovered that it had just uh, frozen. It hadn't been maintained since it was installed and the sensor was stuck in that direction. <laughs> so, uh, so they changed all the wind sensors as well uh, as part of the up upgrade, which was quite useful. I think in terms of blowing the pollution in a particular direction, we'll see. So while the COVID uh, problems have been with us and the number of trains have gone up and down, completely meanwhile, there's a company called MSOL who uh, uh, decided that they would install some sensors into platforms 10 and 11 to monitor what the uh, levels were like and hopefully to compare with noise levels as well from the ventilation fans, although that hasn't uh, completely succeeded. But we were lucky, we couldn't get hold of the data from the 100 sensors that have been installed rather than randomly. But uh, MSOL were happy to provide us with data uh, for actual monitoring the levels at platforms 10 and 11, which were the two of the highest platforms. So we have made some progress in terms of using these measurements then to uh, assess the success of the intervention with the new funds. What we found is that the daily air quality index, the levels are definitely reduced from what we had before, but they're still too high. If we plot the 600 then level 10, it's not so bad as the previous graph, but it's still some very high values here. Now, these are the hourly maximum values on each, on each day. And you see that, uh, the, therefore, although the levels have come down, it's still not uh, satisfactory as far as we're concerned. And, uh, more needs to be done, as we'll discuss later. But as far as the occupational health limits are concerned, they really have come down. Uh, so the levels still occasionally getting up above a thousand there for the, uh, for the short term, but uh, nowhere near the short term limit. And the long term is obviously uh, lower than it was before. And obviously, some of this runs through uh, lockdown, and we'll look at that in more detail in a minute. So these are from the study from the beginning of uh, January 2020 uh, through to uh, the 25th of April 2020. You'll see the different levels of the 15 minute levels, the 60 minute levels, and the, the eight hour levels for NO2. And you'll see they're still, still high. There's the 200 limit, it's meant to be uh, the hourly limit. And uh, you see that the levels are all above that. So there's still more to be done. If we look at the impact, these MSOL sensors were installed, as I say, back the data starts, the useful data starts back in February 2020. 
and goes through the lockdown period, which was at the end of March in 2020. And then levels after the first lockdown levels picked up again. So if we look at the NO2 levels, uh, the, that was the average there, pre-lockdown average. Then lockdown, after a sort of delay of about a week, there was a definite drop in the NO2 levels. This is, this is uh, platform 10 at New Street. Which, and then after the lockdown finished, and the traffic resumed, the train traffic resumed to some extent, it went back up again, back to where it was before. The PM levels uh, were quite low and didn't pick up too much, so the, the fans seemed to be working uh, as far as the PM levels are concerned. PM levels are pre-lockdown levels for 2.5 or below 10, uh, which is good. And uh, continues at that level. So the other interventions, apart from the ins installation of the fans, obviously Network Rail is trying to do lots of other things. One is, the main thing is to reduce train idling. And uh, platform supervisors now monitoring the switching off of the diesel engines while the trains are in the, in the platform. And uh, they're introducing dis discipline reports for non-compliance. So that's something that uh, is an obvious, easy one to do. Although in winter, they don't like switching off the diesel trains because they're always afraid they won't be able to restart them. And that will block the station, obviously. So there's a little bit of controversy about that. There is actually some auto shutdown software in terms of uh, automatically shutting down after eight to 12 minutes of idling. And uh, I mean, Virgin are no longer running that line, but uh, they upgraded all of their trains equivalent to 20 trains with auto shutdown. But cross country is only implemented on three trains, which is not so good. Train coupling and decoupling, that takes time. And that's been uh, monitored. Occupational uh, health, health screening for all train dispatch staff. That's ongoing. And then there's uh, obviously, uh, as well as uh, working with RSSB, the research arm, there's also uh, the plans to introduce more electric trains, battery trains, hydrogen trains, a lot of research going on at the moment. And one of the things might be that you could have a hybrid train which would run on diesel outside of the station, but then would switch to a battery to come into the station and then, then dispatch itself and then switch back to diesel. It's one of the uh, things being considered amongst many others. So initial conclusions, the success of the interventions is still being monitored complications from COVID-19, but the new NOx sensors do seem to have activated the ventilation fans more frequently and lowered the overall NOx level by about 30%. But obviously, as we mentioned, the levels are still too high. An unintended consequence is that as the fans are more off and on and on full power now, this has proved to be a noise hazard. There's been a lot of complaints that people can't hear announcements because the fans are on so loud. And obviously, that caused an increase in the carbon footprint of the station as well, the fact that the fans are on. Uh, most of the time during the, during the day. And also the NOx, even when the fans are on, the NOx is being blown into the city centre clean air zone, which is something that we want to investigate as well. <laughs> it's quite ironic. So as with all these things, there's always unintended consequences. The reduced timetable during lockdown reduced levels by a further 30%. Obviously, that's, uh, that's gone again now. So we're looking at about a third reduction, but that's still not enough, really. So we've just written a new paper called The Intervention of the Upgraded Ventilation System and COVID-19 and Air Quality in New Street Station. So uh, that's expressing these latest results. But obviously, that's really interim until we can get back to normal and measure the, the success of the intervention in more detail using the, the 100 NOx sensors that have been installed. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the 
work that we've done has been recognised by the Office of Rail and Road, by Network Rail, by RSSB. So there's a lot of research going on at the moment to improve uh, air quality, not just at Birmingham New Street Station, but in other enclosed stations around the country. And uh, Network Rail produced a new environmental sustainability stra strategy uh, in late 2020. And low emissions is the pillar of their strategy, they mentioned. And they've committed to reduce pollution to by 20, and further 25% by 2030. And in June 2021, new air quality standards will be published, but we haven't seen them yet. And by December 2021, monitoring plans will be implemented regionally. So they are going to start monitoring air pollution for the stations. Now, finally, you might be interested in this particular graph produced by RSSB. This measures the annual NOx emission rate. This was in 2019 along the x-axis and the percentage of diesel trains. And you see that Leeds comes out as one of the uh, worst offenders in terms of something like 80% of the trains at that time were diesel. And they're producing uh, 23,000 kilograms per kilometre of uh, NOx. So obviously Leeds, Leeds needs to be looked at, worse than Manchester, Piccadilly, and New York has got uh, worse than New York, worse than places like Manchester, Victoria. Birmingham is actually down here somewhere, and they say 45% of uh, diesel trains, and uh, therefore we don't produce as much emissions overall. But obviously Birmingham is, the thing about Birmingham is it's trapped in these low tunnels where there's nowhere for the pollution to go. So that's why the monitoring shows much higher levels probably than you'd get in Leeds or Manchester, but who knows, that needs to be explored. So that's me done. So I hope you've understood. And uh, time has flown by, gosh, it's 22 already. Plenty of time for questions though. Thanks, John. That's uh, certainly food for thought. I'll, uh, I'll have your studies in mind next time I'm, I'm at New Street. Um, uh, whilst people um, add their questions to the chat, maybe if I, if I start, I, I wondered um, how Network Rail and the, the train operators had communicated the work to their employees and, and to the public and, and whether they might, whether there was any willingness, I suppose, for them to look at providing public information on the day-to-day -day air quality in the station in, in future or not. Yeah, I mean, that would be something that would be nice. You do see uh, examples of sort of a traffic light system in the station to inform uh, the public as to what the air quality is like. But uh, that's only been talked about. It's no, there's no implementation of such things. I mean, there are also policies to actually, for people who are uh, older people and people with children and prams and so on, who are more susceptible to the pollution, is rather than standing in the centre of the station, to try and get them to stand at the edges where at least there is some fresh air uh, and some mixing going on. But, uh, mm. but as far as the staff is concerned, there have been uh, complaints from the staff of feeling sick and uh, feeling short of breath and so on. But uh, we haven't spoken directly to the, uh, to the unions. And obviously, Network Rail are uh, really, they've changed their policy completely in terms of being in favour now of doing all they can to reduce the pollution levels. So they're obviously they're trying to bring the staff with them, I'm sure, as far as that's concerned. Yes, yes, certainly. Um, we've got a, a question in the chat um, about um, interventions, um, about whether they've considered molecular filters for NO2 reduction, similar to what's used in traffic tunnel vent systems. and, and Maybe a kind of wider question there about what else they've considered other than the, the fans as, as means of, of reducing those um, concentrations inside the station. Now, it's interesting actually that before they did the renovations in 2015, the, there used to be a fan system that went vertical and took the pollution up and out of the above the station. Now it's blowing horizontally, as it were. Now, obviously, they hadn't really any idea as to that wasn't really working, I guess. 
So I, I think uh, they, I don't think they've con considered when they say molecular filters, whether that's uh, I don't think that's ever been considered. I mean, they have considered putting filters on their diesel trains, but I don't think there's been any attempt to do anything else. As far as I know. Mm. I suppose it's also early days in them in them responding um, yeah. to it as well. There's a, 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 a another question um, in the chat about um, residential and commercial property development near to and over railway stations and railways. So where you have building that that is right on top of the um, railways and the and the trains. Um, do, the, the question is: Do you believe the time's come to alert planning authorities about these hazards to human health? And do you have any thoughts on on the implications of the work for spatial planning and and where we put buildings? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it should, should certainly be taken into account, particularly as the the levels in in for, for instance Grand Central, you know, above the station, the shopping centre, the levels in there are too are too high. And uh, obviously, that's another reason to bring the, uh, the to try and get rid of the diesel trains. I mean, that's the the long term aim is to uh, phase out diesel trains and go go electric where we can. But there was a study done in Marleybone Station in London, where there's a lot of development going on there, and the local residents were complaining about the high levels of pollution, but nothing was ever done about it. There's a lot of complaints that uh, they haven't attempted. As far as I know, to uh, um, get as far as the planning departments are concerned, it should be done mm -hmm. in the future. It's, it's, your study throws up a, another kind of angle to that, really, which is that in terms of what is and isn't a material consideration in, in planning, when the focus is on air quality standards based on 24 hour or annual averages. Um, they, they don't necessarily account for these much shorter term peaks in concentration um, when when people are perhaps there for, for shorter times. Uh, we, we have another question about um, NOx in, in, at Leeds Station and, and perhaps this, I think this must relate to one of the figures that you showed, the, um, the units, whether it was uh, micrograms per kilometre or um, how that compared to concentration concentrations in micrograms per cubic meters i i, I yeah that was which the that was the last, last the last picture i showed where leeds was high up on the table that's because it's all done by estimation there's been no monitoring of leeds it's all done by uh, equations if you like in terms of how many diesel trains run through the station and what their average output is per kilometer so that's why the the units are different and the Network Rail have attempted to estimate the output across the entire network. They have a map of uh, the estimates levels. Uh, so that's just before uh, uh, they are hopefully talking about installing sensors in 100 stations across the country to try and look at what levels are actually like. So I'm sure these will be included in that. But it's, but it hasn't been done yet. Nice student project for someone. As, as well as the emission sources, John, were they also considering the nature of the, the stations them, themselves in, in that work, in that where you have emissions, it's the combination of emission source and enclosed space like you have in New Street. Is that, uh, is that something that they would perhaps add to that, to that graph? To, to... Yeah, that's right. That's something they need to do, yeah, to up update those figures, to take into account the, uh, the volume of air that the pollution is dispersed into. Mm. The ceilings in New Street Station are only five or six metres uh, above the ground, whereas the old railway stations, like these, obviously there's a much bigger volume of air for the uh, pollution to go into, uh, which is why Edinburgh and King's Cross weren't as high as Birmingham and New Street. It was primarily the actual geography of the station. That's right, which needs to be taken into account. Mm. And would presumably affect the appropriateness of different interventions, that the, the fans with a high flow rate, flow rate might be more effective in those enclosed spaces, but not necessarily in some of the bigger, more open That's right. areas. So each station has its own microclimate. 
we have a question um, about diesel engines and, and whether different diesel locomotives vary considerably in their emissions and whether the newer models have been an improvement. Um, it, it is the problem that you've, you've shown in, in Birmingham also replicated in London Euston, um, which is also very enclosed? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's another station where they have a lot of diesel trains in fairly confined environments. The black carbon, uh, we have done a, written a paper actually on the black carbon observations, which hasn't been published yet. Hopefully that will be published in the near next few months. But the, the black carbon levels were not uh, above the occupational health standards. There isn't a public health standard for black carbon. So from that point of view, uh, there's still more research needs to be done. As what he says, the roof of Paddington used to be a poorly filled thing. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, they've gone uh, hybrid now, so they, they don't run diesel into Paddington anymore. And a, a related question to, to Roger's um, question in the chat about the, the variation in emissions from different types of diesel locomotive. And you, you mentioned um, anecdotally that, that uh, operators perhaps reluctant to do turn off diesel engines um, during winter in case they don't restart and they block the platforms. Have people looked at the difference in the emission profile um, in terms of um, when they're idling and the startup and, and uh, where you get the question with um, road transport as well about this sort of balance, like how long, how long would a train need to run um, for you to know that it's it's definitely better to turn it off than to start it and stop or stop it and start it again. Yeah, I know. I mean, the average life of the diesel trains is, uh, well, the average length that they've been in service is nearly 30 years. So it's before any legislation as far as uh, we now know it in terms of uh, EU legislation, etc. So a lot of those old trains, you can imagine when they start off with a big blast of air, big blast of smoke as they as, it, as they start up and they say, well, it's worse to, to switch them off and start up again, uh, sort of thing. So I, I guess, yeah, it, it is definitely uh, a problem. And uh, which the electric trains, obviously, they can switch off. But obviously, the other reason they give is to keep the engines running is that they, they need to keep the lighting or the heating or the cooling systems going while passengers are waiting for the train to, to take off. So there's various uh, ways of trying to get around that being considered as well, so that they can switch the engines off. And I think, um, just looking at the time, maybe this is one of the, the, the last questions for you, you, you John, is um, the difference between the um, standards for, for public health for the wider population and occupational health um, with, with the differences that you highlighted today about um, NO2 levels, which, which ones, uh, the, the use of them in practice, which, which one is, a, is appropriate really in, in, the, in these contexts? That's right. I mean, Network Rail have always said that the, the sort of daily air quality index is not applicable within the station because that's uh, an indoor Thing rather than an outdoor, that the Delhi Air Quality Index rather applies to outdoors rather than indoors. But the World, Media, the World Health Organization has recently said that the, the numbers that are used for outdoor can be used indoors as well now. So I think it is applicable for passengers, but no one's ever made this distinction between these people working at the station and the passengers, and yet the passengers are obviously there for quite a long time, and people in the uh, concourses and in the Grand Central Shopping Centre can, can be there for a long time. So I think uh, that needs to be taken into account. And I think um, Network Rail do appreciate that to some extent. So they are coming along. But I mean, the difference between the occupational health and the public health levels are just huge. And again, people uh, in the, I guess one of the reasons is there aren't many instances of where the public and the workers are mixing quite so much for such a long time within pollution. I mean, this is probably one of the most polluted uh, volumes of air in the country. And uh, so hopefully it's bringing, bringing these sort of issues to the attention. 
the Department of Transport, who uh, I've given similar talks to. I think they're all coming round to the, the view that uh, that gap is too big between the occupational health standards and the public health standards. Hopefully that will come down. Mm. Thanks, John. And, and that's been a really interesting um, summary of your work. And it, it, it does raise so many different um, considerations and, and issues. There's certainly a lot, a lot of food for, for thought there. So thank you again. It's, it's been a pleasure um, having you talk on the, on the seminar series um, and just to close um, as we've, we've got to two o'clock just with the um, seminar series in mind our next seminar is in two weeks time on the 6th of July at 12 o'clock and that will be from Jenny Briley who's a PhD researcher in the School of Architecture at the University of Sheffield and her talk is entitled Zero Carbon and Breathable Homes is the, the Missing Link so all that remains is for me to thank you again, John, and thank you all for dialing in. I hope um, you've enjoyed the seminar series today and we hope to see you again at uh, our next one in future. Thanks. Thanks.